So I'd like to give a brief introduction to uh, the synod for a synodal church that Pope Francis has called for the Catholic Church beginning in 2021 and stretching through 2023. We are in the uh, listening phase of that synod uh, currently in the in our parish and in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. Uh, so just briefly, I'd like to introduce uh, the notion of a synod, uh, what this particular synod is about, and discuss some of uh, Francis's goals for this synod. In October of 2021, Pope Francis opened a process of listening and discernment for the entire church that will last two years, culminating in a synod of bishops, a meeting that will be held in Rome in 2023. He has named the process for a synodal church, communion, participation, and mission. Synod is the Greek word for meeting. It just means meeting. Uh, the word comes from uh, the verb uh, for walking. It means walking together in its, in its root meaning. Uh, and Pope Francis finds in that notion of walking together a, a way to imagine how to revitalize the church and get uh, move the church towards its, its most fundamental reality uh, as communion. In his papacy, Pope Francis has revitalized the church's practice of synods, trying to make them more consultative, inclusive, and open. Uh, the modern synod of bishops uh, began in 1967. It was founded by Pope Paul VI at the end of Vatican II. It was not uh, an act of Vatican II, it was an act of Paul VI. Um, and uh, synods have been held fairly regularly every three to four years ever since then. This will be the 16th general synod. For the past two papacies, these have been largely pro forma meetings, which were controlled by Vatican offices. Consultation was minimal. Uh, the documents were written by the Vatican, and the bishops arrived to Rome to discuss and approve them. Not terribly many changes were made. Uh, Francis has sought to revivify the synod process. Uh, he has three points that he calls for um, uh, frank, sincere honesty, attentive listening, and trying to show how the church uh, should act and be in a synodal way. Uh, so let's go through those uh, three terms. The first one of which is parhesia. Uh, parhesia, is a, uh, parhesia is a Greek word um, that simply means uh, frankness, courage, uh, boldness, and speech. Uh, so uh, he, in one of his discussions of parhesia, uh, Francis uh, quotes Acts 4.13, uh, but it is something that we cannot understand, how these people are so courageous. They have this boldness. And the word boldness there is uh, parisia. Francis says, describing parisia, one general and basic condition is this, speaking honestly. Let no one say, I cannot say this, that they will think this or this of me. It is necessary to say with parisia, all that one feels. It is necessary to say all that. In the Lord, one feels the need to say, without polite deference, without hesitation. And at the same time, one must listen with humility and welcome, with an open heart, what your brothers say. Synodality is exercised in these two approaches. Uh, and this discussion of parhesia here was occasioned by uh, one of the bishop participants in the Synod on the family, uh, expressing to Francis his regret that many of the bishops weren't willing to speak up uh, about things that they, they, they thought the church needed to face, difficult things the church needed to face. And this was Francis' response to that. Right? The, the Synod is a place where you really should raise anything that you, that, that you feel compelled to, that you discern the church needs to, to face. That doesn't mean uh, you know, the church is necessarily going to follow what everyone says, but all those opinions, all those judgments, all those discernments of reality really need to be shared for us to make any um, progress together. The second uh, dimension of Francis's attempt to revivify um, synodality is his notion of the church which listens. And uh, at a very important speech he gave on the 50th anniversary of the founding, of the, the modern founding of the Synod of Bishops, Francis said, a synodal church is a church which listens which realizes that listening is more than simply hearing. It is a mutual listening in which everyone has something to learn. 
the faithful people, the College of Bishops, the Bishop of Rome, all listening to each other and all listening to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, in order to know what he says to the churches, quoting from the book of Revelation there. Finally, he wants to suggest that synodality is uh, the way the church should live and act. Uh, in his words, synodality is the specific modus vivendi et, et operandi, uh, the way of living and operating uh, of the church, the people of God, which reveals and gives substance to her being as communion when all of her members journey together, gather in assembly, and take an active part in her evangelizing mission. It's very important here to understand what Francis is asking for with this two-year synodal process. If the problem the church faced was a matter of confusion over doctrine or, or division over doctrine, or concerning the disciplines and, 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 the, and the laws of the church, there's a way to address that. That's to call a council. That's what councils do. Francis, there's no one stopping Francis. Francis could have called for Vatican III. He didn't. Instead, he chose this very intense process of speaking and listening, of communication over two years, uh, this way of synodal listening. Uh, so the goal here is not simply to gather opinions. Uh, the goal is to revivify the church as a place where people have the freedom and the welcome to speak and be heard. And it's also a place where people listen to one another. So the church can begin to be, in its daily practices, a church which listens. And that kind of listening and that kind of freedom of speech is essential, really, to be a communion, right? Um, to be a communion without actually paying attention to one another is purely abstract and falls short of the gospel ideal. We'll say more about this later. So the first phase of this synod will be listening processes on the local level, beginning in parishes, like the meeting we're having here in Immaculate Conception. Uh, then representatives from our parish will take this to a diocesan listening session, uh, and the diocese will gather together and somehow synthesize all the input from all these listening sessions around the archdiocese. The next stage is that each diocese contributes that to a national conversation convened by the um, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Uh, in the past, synods you know, may have asked uh, bishops to consult the, 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 the faithful of their, of their, of their diocese. Uh, Francis made the big point of this with the synod on the family and the synod on, on youth. Uh, but then they take that directly to Rome. Uh, what's happening here is that there's a focus on conversation on all levels. Right? So there's a diocesan conversation. And then each diocese takes its report to a national gathering. Right? So the, the church in the United States will then gather and synthesize and reflect upon what it heard. And then the bishops from the United States will gather with the other bishops on the continent. So Canada, Mexico, the Caribbean, all the North American continent will gather and listen to each other once again. Notice how different this is, right? It's not simply uh, you know, uh, uh, filling in forms and compiling data. It's listening to one another. Uh, what might the church in the Caribbean or the church in Mexico have to say to the church in the United States? What might we have to say to them? How might, what might we learn if we listen to one another? Right? We're so close, yet those lines that divide us uh, are enormously powerful, far too powerful for what the Catholic Church stands for as a communion of all peoples. Let's look at the Synod on the Amazon, uh, which was a special synod. There are different kinds of synods. Uh, ordinary, extraordinary, and then special synods. And so uh, the Synod on the Amazon, on the Pan-Amazonian region, was a special synod convened to uh, engage the, the culture and people and uh, the ecology, the environment of the Amazonian region, uh, this, this great place of enormous biodiversity and enormous importance for uh, global life, uh, a place that's uh, involves many different countries, right? No single national church can really address the Amazonian region. Um, and also a place that involves many, many different cultures, a vast variety of indigenous peoples, uh, some of whom are part of the Catholic Church, some of whom are not. 
Uh, so it's worth us looking at the, the enormous energy and organization that went into listening uh, that constituted the these Pan-Amazonian Synod. Uh, 260 listening events that were held throughout the region. Uh, 170 of those weren't simply listening events, they were regional assemblies. Uh, by, by the count of the Vatican, they reached nearly 87,000 people. Uh, not only members of the church, but also indigenous peoples of other religious traditions, as well as human rights experts, activists, and ecological experts as well. So here was this uh, point where the church really modeled for the rest of the world uh, how we can listen to one another. And I, I think one of the most important things about the Synod on the Amazon is, is that uh, the church in the first world, the church in the United States, uh, we are in relationship with the people of the Amazon, with the ecology of the Amazon. Um, it's, you know, our, our iron ore comes from there and it shows up in the steel in our cars. Um, there are major export, you know, the, the, the forests are being cut down to build, uh, to plant vast fields of soy and that's on the global market. So that's in our milk, that's in our food, that's in the feed for some of our cattle. Uh, so we're deeply connected to these places, but our connection to the Amazon is not really mediated by the church. It's mediated by these, these global commodity chains, these global supply chains. Uh, and the Synod on the Amazon was an attempt to say, no, the church can be its own network. The church can bring us into relationship in a much more profound way. We, the church can, can be a way of listening to people who are never listened to. And so in some ways, I think the, the Synod on the Pan-Amazonian region really was a model for what Francis wants to do with this Synod on Synodality for the entire church. All right, let's turn to three points. Uh, Francis calls them three opportunities uh, for the Synod. Uh, and this is from his opening speech uh, in October when he opened the, the two-year process. Uh, the first opportunity is that of uh, moving not occasionally, but structurally towards being a synodal church, a church that's an open square where all can feel at home and participate. Uh, so not just marking it as a, you know, as a unique event, uh, a one-off thing that may be profound and we can celebrate, but the goal really is for the church itself to become synodal, to, to live its life in a way that involves this deep communication, this deep listening. Uh, the, sec the second opportunity that Francis saw was um, the opportunity to become a listening church to break out of our routine and pause from the, the pastoral concerns the church is always dealing with in order to stop and listen, to listen to the spirit and adoration and prayer. He said today, how much we miss the prayer of adoration. So many people have lost not only the habit, but also the very notion of what it means to worship God. And then also to listen to our brothers and sisters, listen to them speak of their hopes and of the crises of faith present in different parts of the world, of the need for a renewed pastoral life, and of the signals we are receiving from those on the ground. So these two listenings that go together in synodal listening, right, listening to God, opening, quieting ourselves and listening to what the Spirit is moving us to, what the Spirit is saying, and simultaneously listening to our brothers and sisters in the church and outside of the church and see what they are saying as well. Uh, third, uh, the opportunity to become a church of closeness. Uh, he says, let us keep going back to God's own style, which is closeness, compassion, and tender love. God has always operated that way. If we do not become a church of closeness with attitudes of compassion and tender love, we will not be the Lord's church. Not only with the words, but also by a presence that can weave greater bonds of friendship and society and the world. The church that does not stand aloof from life, but immerses herself in today's problems and needs, bandaging wounds and healing broken hearts with the balm of God. Let us not forget God's style, which must help us, closeness, compassion, and tender love. What I'd like to point out here is this notion of closeness, of intimacy, uh, and of, of, of communication, listening, uh, has, enormous resonance with the, the one of the fundamental ways of thinking about the church that were, was suggested in this that was taught by the Second Vatican Council. Uh, in the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church, one of the fundamental documents for understanding the nature and mission of the church um, is what's called Lumen Gentium, the, 
light of the nations. And it opens with the words that the church is like a sacrament uh, which of the unity of humankind in God. That the church's identity and mission was to be a communion for all people. And this notion of being a sacrament of unity, this notion of being communion, really requires deep communication, right? You can, we can imagine ourselves symbolically being a unity. We can we come into church on Sundays and imagine that we're in communion with the people around us uh, and, and gathering together in the liturgy um, and praising God together. Uh, but if we don't know each other in any way, there's a way in which that, that, that unity does fall short. And Francis is calling for the church to really live into that communion, live into being a sacrament of the unity of humankind. And synodality is that process. Two final points about the process that get more specific. Uh, first, uh, the handbook for the synod makes very clear this process is not simply for people who are happy with the state of the church or who consider themselves to be insiders. The instructions for the synod stress the importance of taking care to listen, especially to persons or groups who are left on the margins uh, or companions that are outside of the church. This is a broad listening. It wants to hear from the people who don't feel like the church wants to hear from them. This is the first question uh, in, the, in, the, in the synodal um, handbook. What are you doing to listen to those um, from the margins? Finally, I think what I've said conveys this, but I want to say it quite concretely. The purpose of the synod, this is again a quoting from the preparatory document. The purpose of the synod is not to produce more documents. Rather, it's intended to inspire people to dream about the church we are called to be, to, be, to make people's hopes flourish, to stimulate trust, to bind up wounds, to weave new and deeper relationships, to learn from one another. So in your input tonight, uh, in, your, in the conversations we'll have tonight, uh, we will listen to those. Uh, we have the, the online parish uh, survey, which we encourage all of you to take. Um, we'll try to gather all that up and take it with us to uh, the deanery gathering uh, next Thursday. Uh, but I want to stress that, you know, as valuable as it is to hand on your insights, your concerns, your hopes for the church, uh, Francis wants to see that there's, there's simply value already in listening to one another and attending to one another, that these conversations are a way of realizing the very nature of the church. Thank you.